My name is Warren Palmer. I'm a professor in the Department of Economics, and it's been my pleasure this year to organize the seventh Upton Forum. Um, tonight, we're having our second of four public events in this year's forum. The topic of this year's forum um, are the um, economic policy and the challenges, ta challenges of climate change. And uh, we built our forum this year around the work of uh, Robert N. Stevens from Harvard, who will be here, who is here to join us in the conversation. Let me explain how tonight's panel will work, and then I'll say a few other words of introduction. Um, I will introduce each panelist in turn so they can be nice and comfortable sitting in the padded chairs rather than sitting in front facing you all. Um, each panelist uh, will give their presentation, and then uh, Professor Stevens will um, deliver some res uh, remarks in response to their um, presentations. At that point, we'll then ask all of our panelists to come up and sit uh, uh, in the hard chairs and then we can do a question and answer period. Um, before we launch into our first presentation, let me first tell you a little bit about the Miller-Upton Forum. The Miller-Upton Forum um, was founded and named in honor of the sixth president of Beloit College. Uh, we call this the uh, wealth and well-being of nations, and each year, we bring in one of the world's leading thinkers on some aspect of wealth and well-being of nations. What is it that uh, contributes to uh, wealth and well-being, or what is it that uh, inhibits or retards the wealth and well-being of nations? And the reason we do this is to honor his, uh, Miller Upton's memory. He devoted his career to advancing the ideals of the liberal society uh, political freedom, rule of law, and the promotion of peace and prosperity through the voluntary exchange of goods, services, and ideas. He felt that transforming the ideals of liberal democracy into real institutions was at the heart of the very hard work of increasing the wealth and well-being of nations. Um, and we are very pleased to be able to have a representative of Miller Upton's family with us tonight. Uh, John Upton, his grandson, is in the audience. And we're doubly pleased because John is a, a journalist working in the environmental area. Um, this uh, panel tonight is on renewable energy, climate change, and entrepreneurship. Let me explain why those terms are together. So we know that climate change is starting to take place due to uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And we know that it will continue to get worse because the greenhouse gases that humans have already added to the atmosphere uh, have a fairly long half-life, 100 years or more, and we're continuing to burn fossil fuels. Those fossil fuels have done wonderful things for human prosperity, and they continue to do wonderful things for human prosperity. It's what makes us be able to meet in this room tonight, be nice and warm, and have the lights on, and to have these images projected in front of us. We know, though, that there is a really serious externality with burning fossil fuels, um, and that is the release of carbon dioxide. So the challenge that the world faces is to continue to expand the supply of commercial energy, particularly to those um, populations that are in poverty today and that don't have access to clean electricity or who don't have access to flexible fuels such as gasoline or diesel or to natural gas. So what the world needs 
uh, today is more energy supply, not less. So we need to grow our energy supply, but at the same time, we need to figure out how to do this without uh, increasing the rate at which we're adding greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And we need to figure out a way to reverse this. Renewable energy has to play a fundamental role in this change. And the way that will take place is through pricing carbon into the economy and then turning loose the entrepreneurs of the world to do the really hard work of figuring out, well, what is the best, cheapest way to replace fossil fuel energy with renewable energy? So that's the um, purpose of our panel discussion tonight. And let me introduce our first panelist, John Clancy, uh, president of uh, Friends of Wisconsin, uh, an important environmental lawyer in the state of Wisconsin. And John's going to talk to us about um, legal and financial arrangements that help facilitate the expansion of solar energy. John? Thank you very much, Warren. As, as Warren mentioned, my name is John Clancy. I'm an attorney in Madison, Wisconsin, and I work in the environmental area as, as well as the clean energy area. And I, he, I met with Warren, and he asked me to talk about kind of a, a practical approach to solar power, to think it through, especially with the, the college uh, hopefully obtaining the powerhouse, uh, the project along the river from Alliant Energy, and turning that into a, a green, uh, sustainable, and beautiful building for the, for the center, for the, for the campus, and an opportunity to really attract uh, folks to this part of Beloit and the Beloit College. But to think about that project as an opportunity to perhaps bring solar into the equation, solar to the college, and how can we do that? And I wanted to, to focus on a couple of kind of key themes. One is what Warren talked about, that obviously uh, the energy that the college uses now and that the rest of us in Wisconsin and throughout the United States use now especially in Wisconsin, tends to be primarily coal-based, uh, and it has externalities that, are, uh, that apply to it or that, that come with it. Uh, there's the carbon externalities, but there's other externalities as well. I'll talk about those a little bit. But then I want to then move on to, you know, a, a, an entity like uh, Beloit College and other colleges and other nonprofits, frankly, typically have very strong sustainability goals. And, uh, but one issue with that is that uh, because of the way they're organized, they can't receive all the incentives to bring in many sustainable projects, especially a solar project. So I want to focus in on, are there strategies to allow a college like Beloit to use basically tax incentives to meet its sustainability goals? And then actually, when they want to take it one step further and think about, is there a way of using those incentives to actually create the equivalent of, an e of a green endowment for the, the college that could provide scholarships or other kinds of operational benefits to the college that would create an annuity uh, for ongoing operating expenses and perhaps one bucket could be for, for scholarships for students uh, through a project that would be physical, be really here, not like a, a normal endowment where it's, a, you know, it's in some bank account, but you could see it, but it would also produce an income stream for the, for the college. I want to talk about that a little bit if that's okay. Um, make sure I can do this right. So this is actually a slide that Warren helped me with. Uh, we were meeting for uh, breakfast on Sunday and talking about my presentation and talking about, you know, what's, how much does a college pay for electricity and what are the real societal costs of the electricity the college uses? So one thing we talked about was the fact that there's been economic studies of this issue. They're actually combined, they're, they're scientific and economic together because they need the science to know what comes out of the power plants when electricity is produced. So this is a, this talks about what comes out of a coal-fired power plant. In Wisconsin, about 60% or 65% of our energy is coal-fired. And Beloit College, like everybody else who isn't under a special kind of renewable program for their energy, uses about 65% coal-fired power. The rest is primarily natural gas. Um, but basically, there's a, there's a ton of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour of energy produced from a power plant. And if you assign... Um, a, essentially a $30 per, car, per ton carbon tax to that, it ends up being about $0.03 cents per kilowatt hour of costs that are not 
kind of paid for by us, but are caused by us to the environment and society generally. There's also costs from other emissions from coal fire power. Um, as you might know, coal has relatively high amounts of mercury, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, as well as other, other chemicals that cause damage to the environment. Uh, and there's studies that have been done about the cost of those to society. So when you add those two together, at least according to this study, I think there's different studies that are out there, so you gotta you know, kind of take every study and look at it very carefully, but this indicates that there's about 6.2 cents per kilowatt hour of societal costs that are not picked up when we use energy, when we use electrical energy from coal-fired power plants. So again, it, we're not using completely coal here, so you'd have to diminish that somewhat, but it kind of tells you that there are costs out there from us using energy that are not included in our energy bill. And Warren was nice enough to share with me what Beloit College pays for. It's at least on peak energy. Where Beloit is a has a unique situation. They can buy all their energy together, as I understand it, from Alliant, the utility, in bulk, and then use it in these various buildings, which is very cost effective for the college and a very, very good idea. It allows you to basically aggregate your loads together and to, to get a lower energy cost. But if you look at what the on peak energy costs for Beloit's, Beloit's uh, energy, it's about 6.8 6 cents per kilowatt hour. But when you think about it, it should be likely higher when you're thinking about all the costs. So that's the kind of um, analysis I think that starts to make you think, well, if the college has a strong sustainability goal, shouldn't we somehow be addressing the costs that the college is not paying for and hopefully do it in an effective way, an economically effective way for the college? And the next thing I want to talk about was, is kind of a catch-22 that a lot of our clients are in that I work with, and I think Boyd like College faces the same thing. Um, one thing is that's great, is that uh, solar and actually other renewables in general have come down in price. Solar actually, if you looked five years ago, was not cost-effective at all, especially in a state like Wisconsin. Now it's gotten to the point where it at least can be cost-effective if it's structured in a way that's, that makes sense for the entities involved. Um, one big thing about it, though, is that the primary incentive, especially in a state like Wisconsin, where we don't really have other incentives here, we don't really have state incentives that are very strong anymore, the primary incentive for solar is the 30% investment tax credit that's allowed from the federal government and the depreciation that can be allowed on the asset if an entity is taxable. So um, the key issue is that Beloit's not taxable. It's, it's great for the college in general. Obviously, I think the college wants to pay taxes. <laughs> on the other hand, it can't receive these tax benefits. So the question is what to do. So as I mentioned, there's, there's two primary tax incentives, the 30% investment tax credit, which for solar, and this is, a, this is the way the law works, it's great for the clients I work with that want to get involved in solar because it covers the whole project. Some, for some projects, you know, like uh, we worked actually on a number of biogas plants, some parts of the plant may not be quali might not qualify because they don't qualify as eligible equipment. For solar, everything does, which is, which is great for these projects. Secondly, it has a short depreciation schedule, much shorter than like a building um, or other um, projects that typically are under, you know, perhaps a 30 or 40 year depreciation schedule. So both those things provide money to taxpayers and are very valuable to them and drive down the cost of solar projects for taxable entities. They do nothing for Beloit College. So the question is, how do you make it work? And I'm not going to I'm going to keep this at a, from a legal perspective at a relatively high level um, because this is primarily an economic conference, but there are two mechanisms that the IRS or Treasury Department recognizes that can allow for these kinds of situations to occur where Blake College, a nonprofit, can receive the benefits of, a, of the tax benefits of the investment tax credit and depreciation. One is oftentimes called the partnership flip. Although actually, I, I'd say in its variations, because we don't even, we don't recommend that that be used, but it's a structure, but he talks about it's a common parlance for it. I'll tell you why you don't use that. And then secondly, talk about the sale lease back. But the primary one is what's oftentimes called the par partnership flip. And what happens there is that the college can enter into a partnership with a taxable entity to form, typically it's, it's an LLC, a limited liability company, but it's ba that's basically the same thing as a partnership. Uh, under which the college initially is assigned only a small amount of ownership for tax purposes, usually 1%, and the taxable investor gets 99%. And you could say, well, why do you want to do that? Why does the college want to give that, own that ownership interest? The reason why 
is because if it's a 1% ownership interest by the college, which is non-taxable, and 99% by the taxable entity, 99% of the tax benefits can be monetized, can be obtained by the taxable entity. And, you know, as, as folks that are involved in transactions that all know, once you got that money in the pie, it can be divided up however is appropriate. So if the college is bringing value to the project, it can receive as much of those benefits as it can bargain for. Um, that LLC then will sell energy to the college. That's the basic structure. Uh, it's called the flip because the IRS allows for a flip to occur at, once, the, um, once a five-year period passes without any tax consequences. But frankly, there's better ways of doing that where you don't lose depreciation. I won't go into great detail about that, but there's ways of doing it better than the partnership flip. The second structure is what's called the sale leaseback. And that's really all it means is that the college may build the solar plant, but it sells it to a taxable entity before, before it's been operational too long. And then it can lease the plant back from the, from the entity, and the entity, the taxable entity, can get the tax benefits. So this, this structure actually allows for a completely efficient use of the tax benefits because 100% of the tax benefits can be utilized by the taxable entity. The issue there is, though, that typically that is a financing issue. The, the partnership flip allows the taxable entity to become part of, the, part of the partnership from the beginning, and oftentimes it will then finance the project for the non-taxable entity, or at least in large part. Uh, so that's the structure we've been typically using. Um, and the basic point is, you know, the question is why go through all this stuff? The reason why is because it matters from a financial point of view. And I guess when you think about it from a real high level, you can see where it makes sense. You know, you have the 30% investment tax credit, that pays for almost a third of the project. Depreciation, I won't go into great detail about how it works, but you, know, but you get back, you get back on, on their taxes, they can depreciate the value of the asset over a seven year period of time. What that essentially, a lot of investors would say that that has the same amount of value as a 30% investment tax credit to us. So you're basically paying for 60% of the project through tax incentives. So that's a lot better than the college doing it on its own, does it on its own, it has to pay for it all itself. And so I'll go through some numbers I receive from one of the solar companies I work with often um, on both, both with and without incentives. But then when I talk about with incentives, I want to talk about that structure I talked about a little before, which is that, and this relates to some projects I'm working on right now, where I'm working with tribes and others that have the ability to, to raise money uh, for a portion of the project, which then further drives down the cost of the project and allows for a quick payout, basically under this power purchase agreement, and is used as a method in, in one case for a tribe to receive um, the facilities for free after just paying 80% of their normal costs of energy for five years. So it's a very good situation for it. I think what makes more sense here for the, for the college is that this can actually create an income stream for the college, which could be used for, for scholarships or for whatever's appropriate to drive down operational costs. So this is a picture, you probably, I don't know if you've seen it in the, in the paper, there's a big announcement about the, the powerhouse and the potential purchase of it by the college, and it's very exciting. It would create a real statement along the river and is, uh, is already going to be a very green building regardless of, of the solar discussion. But the solar discussion allows us to think about maybe this could become a, what they call often a, a net zero building, a building that uses no energy from outside itself, or at least on a, on a kind of a mass balance approach, ends up being net zero for energy. Um, so that's the building. And so if we were to integrate solar in and around that building and in and around the campus, the question is how would that work with and without the incentives? So without any tax incentives, um, you know, Warren again gave to me, uh, he gave me some, some numbers in terms of how much energy the, the college uses. And then I, when I talked to the solar development folks I work with, or one of them at least, and we noted that you could probably put a 2.8 megawatt system here and not have excess energy that goes to the grid. And the reason for that is that if we, if we produce too much, uh, the college would then only be able to sell it at market rates, which would be wholesale market rates, which is instead of 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour, it'd probably be like two or three cents per kilowatt hour. So that doesn't make any sense. So what, let's size it appropriately. But this is sizing it appropriately, but as big as you can go. Um, and so if you look at it in terms of you know, how much would you offset in energy usage? Uh, we assume it at six cents per kilowatt hour. That's actually not as much as the on-peak, and the reason for that is that on-peak is only for weekdays, and you produce on weekends too, so you have a blended cost of energy. Uh, that would produce about $190,000 worth of offset revenue, basically our offset energy costs per year, so essentially revenue to the college, but it would take you a long time to pay it back because you have to pay a six and a quarter million dollar facility still with no tax incentives 
and you get a 24, basically 24 year return, a 1.7 internal rate of return, uh, which is a, you get a little better return if you think about it in terms of just you know payout if it was like a like a bond, but it's not taking you very far. Um, and then you um, and then this is the kind of the key assumptions that were used. You know, you're gonna need a fair one thing to just point on this is physical realities here. You're gonna need a fair amount of space for this facility regardless whether you do it with taxes or tax incentives or not. It's gonna take about 15 acres of space. On the other hand, you can utilize roof space and the roof of this powerhouse is very large. So that provides a platform for a good part of this. There's other buildings on campus that could be utilized and probably other land that could be utilized as well. And I'll show a picture that shows kind of a look at that a little bit too. So then you think about, well, what if we did it with tax incentives? And I'm actually gonna give you um, a scenario, and this is, I'm cheating a little bit, this is a combination of tax incentives, but with some money from the college. And I don't know if it's really cheating or not, but it's just it's a, a way of thinking about it that it doesn't mean the college wouldn't put any money in, because if a tax investor comes in, you're not gonna pay for the whole project through the tax incentives, and they, they need to return themselves. They want a percent return on their investment or their own IRR. But we work through, this is, a, this is very similar to a project we're working on now with a school district. Uh, and in that case, the school district um, has a bond issue to do a lot of energy efficiency work on the school. And they did the work, and they actually, it was good. They, they were more cost effective than they thought they'd be. They have about $225,000 left over. So they're gonna use that as their capital contribution towards the solar project, towards about a $400,000 or $425,000 solar project and are partnering with a tax, you know, a tax investor uh, to drive down the cost of the project. So this would be similar, but on a different scale, a much larger scale, obviously, about, about 10, 10 times the scale. Um, if the college were to fundraise, let's say $4 million for this project, and actually, I talked back and forth with this person, Adam Gussie at, at, at h, h Solar, about, well, what should we make that number? And we were talking about the fact that you know, should it be half or should it be less? Because could, you could also go lower and then have a higher power purchase payment, or you could go higher and have a lower power purchase payment. We were talking about the fact that, although the, the college obviously has a, has a big task in itself to raise money for this powerhouse. But on the other hand, and with the nonprofits I work with, it's much easier to raise money for capital projects than it is for operational expenses. And I think the college experiences the same thing. And it's much easier, it's kind of much, much easier to raise for cool capital projects than it is for boring ones or bo really boring operating costs, you know. So the question is, how, do you, how are you most effective in your fundraising and in use of your assets? And so one thing we usually do is, again, we work with our clients to identify low-cost opportunities for money for them to contribute to these projects. For instance, um, with the tribe I talked about, I think, well, I, think I mentioned, the tri I work with the, the tribes as well as other entities. A tribe I'm working with now, we work with them to get a DOE tribal energy grant, a $1.4 million grant for a $2.8 million project, that's real free money for it. Um, the, the school district example is one where you have relatively low cost money for it. This is another example of, I think, in the scheme of things, relatively low cost money for the college because you're making the powerhouse project kind of cooler, you're making it more sustainable, you're making it more attractive to essentially your investors, the donors that would help pay for the project. And so we, we again, it's a long way of getting to this point, but we got to the $4 million number because we thought, well, the college can probably do a more effective job in raising for capital costs on a cool project than it can for operating costs. So that allows for, uh, based on some of the, the, the economics of some of the projects we've done, based on the, re the return re required by the tax investor, uh, you, where, where you could likely, get a, likely be able to have the project finance where $4 million is paid for by the school, $2.25 million is paid for by tax investor. And the tax investor, just so you know, it loves this because it gets, um, it gets the full, even though it's only putting in two and a quarter million dollars, it gets the 30% investment tax credit as if it paid for everything. So that takes care of a good chunk of its investment already. Plus it gets the depreciation available on the project. So this would allow for a, a much lower PPA than what the college is paying for energy. And so it could buy energy at two cents rather than six cents. And then at the end of six years, there probably have to be some kind of a buyout because of the way tax law works and to, to make it work. I don't want to go into great detail about that, but this would provide for about $130,000 savings now for the next, you'll say six years. Plus at the end, it would probably, if you assumed 3% energy costs rising, which is a, which is a very probably conservative assumption, um, we'd be, the college would be making basically $220,000 a year at that point in time. 
which would increase by 3% per year. And so that increases the, you know, re well, reduces the payback, increases the internal rate of return on the project. Uh, and actually, it's probably more like the 16.8 and 5.3% because that's what we're working on in projects now based on what investors are requiring. But it would also allow for the creation of what I would think of as being a, a green endowment for the school. It would, you know, instead of putting $4 million in an endowment, you have $4 million in the solar project. The solar project spits out initially $130,000 a year, later about a quarter million dollars a year that could be used for whatever is appropriate. It could be scholarships, it could be other things. So uh, it's an interesting, I think, way of thinking through how this project could create uh, multiple levels of value for the, for the college. And then here's just, um, again, I talked about, we, if we do it this big, we need a fair amount of space. So the question is, how do you make that work? There's also likely to be, there'll be a lot of utility issues, interconnection issues. Alliant, for instance, has a two megawatt limitation on, on, on certain interconnection requirements you have to work through. Um, and there's also the question, if you're gonna put it on land itself, what's the opportunity cost of that land too? And obviously figuring that out. Rooftops, not so much typically where you don't use the roof for anything else. And so here, the final slide I think is this map that shows, um, I think this is right, uh, the powerhouse up here as well as other or college properties that could potentially hold uh, solar. This together, I believe, um, would provide about um, enough for about a megawatt and a half or close to two megawatts. The question is then where else in the campus would we find opportunities you want to go to the full 2.8 megawatts? Um, with respect to a net energy, net zero energy building, uh, we'd have to look exactly at what the energy needs of the, of the powerhouse would be. I assume, I'm assuming it's substantially less than the college campus itself. So you could actually, if you wanted to, put in a smaller system and have it offset the energy use of the powerhouse and not have to go to the full 2.8 megawatts. Conversely, you go to a larger system and cover more of the college itself and be perhaps be net, net zero for the powerhouse as well as reducing for the rest of the campus. I think that's it. So I just thank you very much. I was about to ask if it was seeming a little chilly to you over there. Um, thank you very much, John. That was terrific. Um, I really want to thank John for managing to squeeze an hour-long presentation into 20 minutes. Um, and our next presenter, uh, John Nelson, is the Managing Director and Chief Technology Officer for Global Infrastructure Asset Management. Um, he was the former chair and is an emeritus member of the Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies Board of Visitors at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he did a Master's of Mechanical Engineering at UW-Madison and worked in the UW-Madison Solar Energy Laboratory. Um, uh, up until the mid-90s, you were the CEO of Affiliated Engineers? 2004. 2004. So up to 2004, John was the um, CEO of Affiliated Engineers, uh, a large international engineering firm. Uh, and since then, he has worked um, in a number of positions, including being an advisor to uh, venture capital firms, and now is a partner in global infrastructure, along with uh, um, Bill Fitzgerald, who is a Beloit alum. So uh, please welcome uh, John Nelson. Thank you, Warren. Good evening, everyone. Do you, do you want to use the... At the end. At, I'll the, use end. The, at the end. Okay, you. we'll have to kill this. We'll, we'll figure a little technology out. I apologize, I'm not going to use PowerPoint. My students trained me early in the 2000s about this new discipline called PowerPoint coma, where I give them the yeah. slides and they go to sleep and then, <laughs> then they uh, check out at the end of class. So I'm going to actually draw on the board for a minute. Thank you. That was a <laughs> remarkable presentation, John. Uh, and uh, I'm going to pick up a little bit on, on some, of the, some of the ideas uh, you presented. And I'm, I'm representing the entrepreneur element of the agenda or of the title. Our company 
raises capital in the private markets and deploys it in either companies or projects. Thank you. Yeah. Our company raises capital and deploys it in either uh, companies or projects that do the kinds of things John talked about. In fact, our companies, some of my partners have collaborated with you on other matters before. So we might be that vehicle that would allow the project to occur that John talked about. But I'd like to take a step back first and talk at the first principles about our ideas about this marketplace. And uh, the reason I want to do that is because the way entrepreneurs get it, take advantage in the marketplace is when they realize a need that will exist in the future and they get ahead of that need and put themselves in a position to solve that problem uh, before the market really knows it, it needs it solved so that the market kind of comes to you. So I'll, I will begin my remarks with just a real simple diagram about how man conducts, humans conduct their business with nature. Uh, this gets to um, uh, uh, civil engineering quite a bit. But right now the transactions between man and nature occur principally in a vertical manner, right? Where man either extracts or puts something back in nature for economic benefit. And the point that John made is that we don't actually, pri we only price the economic benefit to us. We don't price the cost to nature. That's the differential that he talked about for externalities in the cost of electricity, right? So from a very fundamental perspective, we're now in the Anthropocene. And we believe at Global Infrastructure Asset Management that this transaction has to change from vertical to more horizontal, more balanced. That this relationship between man and nature has to become more balanced. Now this is a pretty literal representation, but this is, this is now, and this is the future, and we're betting that, that if we figure out how to do that, we will be ahead of, in economic terms, we will be ahead of uh, the competition. So that begs, what's, you know, every research uh, pr project needs to begin with asking the right research question. So what's the research question? And I'm about to commit heresy in a group of economists. Uh, but, but you invited me here, so here we go. Uh, at first principles, is this an economic problem that can be solved simply by financial means? Or at first principles, is this a physical problem? Where's Paul? A physics problem. That, that no amount of money alone can solve. This matter of energy, climate, uh, the, the coupling of the two. And Warren expressed it elegantly at the beginning where we talked about how we benefit from burning fossil fuels, how many people benefit from burning fossil fuels. So this isn't one of those either or choices, it's not like smoking, where if you quit smoking, your health gets better, you spend less money. This is a, this is a, a hard choice where we have to strike a balance. So is it a, a, is, it a, is it a financial problem at first principles? Is it a physical problem? Or is it both? And our premise is it's both. And you have to strike the balance in financial and natural terms. So our premise, our business premise, our investment premise, everything we do, and by the way, these diagrams that I'm sketching roughly will be available in a handout at the end. I think Warren's got some copies in the back. Everything that we do is, uh, seeks to find this balance between these two poles, one of which is financial motivation and the other of which is environmental or natural motivation on this fulcrum around social capital. And in the context of improving human capital. Okay. So uh, the, the, the striking the balance is, is the key 
for us as entrepreneurs and for how we deploy our capital, which is often your money, one way or the other. And I, I will, I will make, take one exception with John where he said free money that came from the government. That's not really free. Somebody ultimately <laughs> provided that money. Um, and and, the, and the, money that, the money that we spend is our money, it's your money, it's foundation, endowment money. And uh, interestingly enough, when it turns out to be your money, you get very interested in the rate of financial return on it, particularly when it involves your retirement uh, endowment. So, uh, so we, we strike this balance with, a, with a, uh, a keen eye on fair financial return, but also on um, doing, the, doing the right thing with natural capital. And I'll come back to natural capital in just a minute, but in, in the interest of getting to the end and then coming back and repeating it, I'm just going to give you the headlines of what this leads to. First of all, while all renewable energy is solar-based, I always find it kind of interesting when I hear people say solar, hydro, and wind, because actually hydro and wind are just conveyance mechanisms for solar energy. So while all renewable energy on the planet is solar-based, it's not all the same. There are some, uh, some forms of energy that strike this balance better. I make all my electricity with solar PV, uh, but we would not invest in John's project because it is, in our opinion, over-financialized. It's very complicated from a financial perspective, and it relies on a resiliency of financial predictability that you can't really build a business around because we had an election yesterday and all of those things that John's uh, structure relies on could go away. Not that they'd go away for the project that you, that you proposed, but we're building businesses that need to, need to be able to do this over and over again for a long period of time. So some do strike the balance very well. Hydro strikes the balance well. Solar hot water heating on your house strikes the balance real well. Uh, wind almost strikes the balance well. Uh, some don't. Um, you know, I'm, notwithstanding how, how much uh, uh, solar PVs come down in price, this, this tax equity financing that John talked about is, uh, is like I said, pretty highly financialized. Um, others are proxies for another problem. Uh, so we talk a lot in Wisconsin about biodigesters and digestate and biomass and using photosynthesis to produce renewable energy. Well, uh, photosynthesis does a very good job of creating mass. It does not do a very good job of creating energy. And when we start to extract mass to make energy, we have unintended secondary consequences. Think uh, food for energy. That's an unintended secondary consequence. So um, really, Digesters, when, when I look at them in this broader latitude and ecology, and we own one, digesters to me make renewable energy, but in reality, they're more of a habitat protection uh, at first principles, natural, natural capital play, than they are an energy play. And now I'm gonna go back to Hawkins and Lovins' Natural Capitalism. Anybody remember that book? So there are, there are four capitals that we deal with. We deal with habitat, energy, potable water, and atmosphere. Right? Those are singular singularities. Sorry, singular singularities. Those are singularities. We only have one of each of those. We only have one endowment of fossil fuels. We only have one endowment of potable water. We only have one endowment of atmosphere. Once, once those things are depleted or exploited, we don't have a reset button to hit with them. So what we try to do from an investment perspective is look for projects or companies that have some value connection back to multiples of these. So for example, and to my point about a, 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 a digester, in reality a digester takes contaminants off of the land, concentrates them, 
and puts them in a place we might want to make better use of them, maybe in the form of fertilizer. And it makes a little bit of energy, right? And maybe, maybe by not putting that material on the land, we make the water cleaner or we keep the, po the, the drinkable water in better shape in that land uh, area. With respect to atmosphere, I'm not so sure because with most of the digesters in Wisconsin or in the upper Midwest, we spend a lot of diesel fuel hauling water around. And I think if the, if the rates weren't so skewed to, to reward renewable energy with cheap gas or diesel fuel to haul the material around that makes the renewable energy, if that flipped around, I'm not so sure digesters uh, would do quite so well economically. But the point here is that a digester is more about habitat protection with some incidental energy benefit and some incidental potable water benefit. And the problem is we can't financialize this right now. We can't get anything for that right now. We can't get anything for that right now. We can get a little bit for this and a little bit for this. But those are very thin value lines. So when we look at projects, we look through this screen of balance and the, five, the four capitals, sorry, the four singular endowments, uh, and try to find things that strike the balance. So now I will use the screen. If we can lower it back down, I'll show you one really cool example of what we do invest in. Oh, and, and while Warren's uh, lowering the screen, I'll give you some other ahas. Uh, I've been at this more than 40 years. Uh, been doing this, uh, this uh, venture capital or capital placement advising for about 10. Here are a few more ahas. Scale really matters. And right now, the best opportunities are small to mid scale, not mega scale. The mega scale stuff is too much money chasing bad ideas. And if anybody invested in a green fund in 08 or 09 in the past few years, you've seen it uh, decline pretty precipitously. So there's too much money chasing those ideas. That's unfortunate because the problem that Warren articulated at the outset is at scale with urgency. So the, the scale that we're able to work at right now is too small to solve the, the, the scale of the problem on the timeline of the problem. But uh, things change. Just, think, uh, just look at uh, how technology has evolved. The other thing I will say is that we do not treat policy, we do not financialize policy. We treat it as frosting on the cake. We need to strike the balance at first principles uh, square and convince ourselves that the investment is a good idea, that we're going to spend your money or our money on something that's a good idea. And if there are policy incentives that have come along on top of it, great, that makes it a better idea. But uh, I'm old enough now to have lived through the Carter administration, Sinfuels, Reagan, and others. So I have personally had financial setbacks from relying on policy resiliency uh, in uh, the United States. And that's just not something we do very well. So we'll take advantage of it, but that's not, our, our initial screens do not have any policy advantage in them. Uh, which again is flying in the face of tonight's conference, I understand that. Uh, and finally, in this business, there are no economic windfalls. This is not medicine, this is not uh, digital technology, it's not software, there are, no, there are no home runs. This takes patient capital invested over a long period of time with, with fair but modest returns. And if someone represents this as having home runs, then there must be something wrong with their physics, in my opinion. So last but not least, this is an example of uh, one of the things we own and we really like. This is uh, called Run of River Hydro. It's small scale hydro. Before rural electrification, uh, there were many small dams built in the, in the upper Midwest or in the, in actually in the developed world at this latitude that were used to power mills, to power plants. Some of these were built by Henry Ford. And while you may say that building a dam has negative environmental consequences, we all have negative environmental consequences when we swing our feet out of bed and step on the ground every day. So nothing is, nothing is absolutely clean, right? So, and these dams are here. So we're starting with them in their current condition. We're able to use technology and improve the output of 
these old dams that have been in place for 100 years by maybe a factor of two or maybe a factor of three, and this is pure green energy. Anybody ever heard of EROI, Energy Return on Investment? Second law of thermodynamics, this is the best. This is the winner. Hydro is the winner for that calculus. So if you come to me and say, this is my retirement funds or my savings so my children can go to college, I want to put it in renewable energy and I want to, make the, I want to do the best I can financially with it, this is, where we would, this is where we would aim at small scale hydro. Okay, so with that, uh, I think this is not just a financial problem. I think it's a first principles uh, natural and financial problem that need to be balanced. I think we need to use uh, uh, the five capitals, natural capital and financial capital with social capital, human capital and manufactured capital, infrastructure like we build, all in play. And I think we need to protect the four singular endowments. And as we get this figured out, I think we wind up in a spot ahead of where the market is right now, because the market doesn't think in those terms. Thanks, Warren. Thank you so much, John. Um, our next speaker um, is Jean, Eugene Zeltman, uh, Beloit class of 62 a trustee of Beloit College who has had uh, quite a distinguished career uh, and is one of the uh, best experts on electric power uh, in the country um, because he was the uh, head of the New York Power Authority and uh, since leaving that position he's been on the board of directors of the organization that runs the electric power grid uh, in this uh, in the Midwest part of the United States. Um, and John is here to, uh, I'm sorry, Gene is here to talk to us about the challenges that the grid faces in being able to integrate uh, renewable energy. Gene Zeltman. Warren, thank you. Thank you all, it's a treat to be here and I, I Remember, you know I love coming back here, so anytime there's an excuse, I'll be here. I think it's right at the beginning, I want to suggest that uh, my comments are, are mine, and not necessarily those of the uh, Mid-Continent ISO, but they might overlap in a few places. Now, we get on the slides here, and we will uh, work off of that once we get that set up. Okay, good, thank you. I'm gonna give you the agenda. This um, will advance it for you. This will, this will forward? Yep. Okay. Let's let it actually, I'll try it. There we go. There you go. This is the agenda for this evening. I want to talk a little bit about the MISO. I want to give you a little bit of information on load generation, the basics there. We'll talk about wind or solar, and as we've heard, that that is clearly a function of solar, but we're going to talk about it as wind and solar enter anyways. You're going to hear a few words about the smart grid, and then, of course, there's always the question, where are we going to go from here? Now, taking a look at this chart, you see that the history in that chart goes back to the 1880s when we had not a lot of people getting electricity. They were in cities. They were in areas that were served by small power plants. They were not necessarily connected. And that went on for a long period of time. The rural areas really didn't have all that much electricity. In 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt, I hope some of you happen to see the Roosevelts on PBS. I thought that was just terrific. But Franklin Roosevelt formed the New York Power Authority. And <coughs> from that, there was then the beginning of public power for more rural areas. In the 30s, mid-30s, 35, 36, 
Tennessee Valley Authority began to develop again under his aegis and promoting. And so now we had not only electricity in the cities, we also had it in rural areas. Along comes World War II, and there was an enormous, enormous amount of electricity which was consumed in the war effort. And some of the things that were created during that time period, we still saw at the Power Authority. For example, from Utica up to St. Lawrence in that area, where there were a number of a river in Messina in New York State, Plattsburgh. <coughs> there were a number of aluminum plants, wooden poles. They're still there. So this, if, when, when you make a decision in this industry, it goes on for a very long time, or at least it can. From World War II into the 50s, there was pent-up demand, and you could be, almost be considered a genius because you'd do one of these things and say, I think electricity is going to grow at 7% a year, and indeed it did. And that went on until the middle 70s <coughs> when we began to see some constraints. Up to that point, people had said, well, we'll go with coal. Then there were some problems, because John L. Lewis and some of you who read this kind of history know that that was not a great thing to, from an economic point of view to have one sole source supplier of energy in the country. And so from coal, we said, well, let's have some oil. And then in the middle 70s, a little later than that, we began to see some perturbations in the Middle East. Oil went from $2, I don't know what it was, $2 a barrel or and we were paying 20 or 30 cents a gallon for gasoline and began to escalate. There were some problems there. And, and then there were some problems. Remember, it was Nixon who started the Environmental Protection Agency because people were concerned about environmental emissions. In the power generation area, you began to get something called new source performance standards for gas turbines and large steam power plants. This is all by way of saying this was becoming an industry that was going to be a little more complicated than everybody thought. Nuclear was always there, always there. From the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was going to be the savior. Energy was going to be too cheap to meter. I don't know why you would re necessarily remember that, but that was indeed the story. Energy's too cheap to meter. Little Bill, there were icons running around, Little Bill. That all changed also. Along comes Chernobyl, along comes Three Mile Island, and people begin to think, well, maybe, and by the way, rates were going up a lot. The stuff that was too cheap to meter, all of a sudden, was getting to be very expensive. People weren't thrilled with their utility commissions. And then, if we, we can make this work, we go on then to what is going on in the last 15 years. And in the last 15 years, the Federal, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in Washington pretty much came to the conclusion that we have to do a better job of utilizing what we have. We have a lot of power lines. We have a lot of <laughs> power generating stations. But, but, just as an example, when a kid like me goes to work for the power industry in 19, whenever it was, 70, 67, the required reserves were 20%. Reserve margins are 20%. That means if you had a load for 100 megawatts, you had to have 20 megawatts sitting in reserve. Now, it's dropped, so you get an idea. On, on the MISO system, it might be somewhat like 12 or 13 percent or something like that. But the idea, over all this time, was to make, with these regional transmission organizations, energy more competitive, use of your existing equipment more efficiently, use of existing transmission lines more efficiently. And that's what this is all about. So what, what the idea of these regional transmission organizations, and there's the MISO in the Midwest, we control the flow of electricity in this area. There's the New York Independent System Operator, there's Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, PJM, California, so there's a couple others. But then you say, well, what else do you guys do? And do you have any benefits? And what is the cost? Well, what's going on here now is that We've heard some of it already tonight. Interest in photovoltaics, interest in solar, interest in wind, interest in hydro. Does this have an impact on the grid? Well, you bet it does. Now, how we'll talk about that a little bit. But that's sort of what this is all about. And 
the use in the smart grid as we define it, somewhat differently than you may be thinking about it. We're looking at things like the use of information and technology to be more efficiently managing electricity generation and transmission. So those are the kinds of things that I want you to be thinking about as, I, as, as we talk. Take a look at those words, improved reliability. I want to establish for you at this moment the design, the design criteria in the electric utility business today. And it's been that way so far as I know, back to the 60s and maybe, maybe before that. One day outage in 10 years. That's the reliability standard that this industry attempts to match as it designs its products. That's, that's the goal. Okay. So now we set that up, and we, I want to take a look now for you. Just a basic, whoops, I'm, I'm ahead of the, this is what it all, that's pretty, that's a, that, that, that's a simple way of looking at how the energy is generated, how it's transmitted, where it goes, and take a look at, there's a house there, and for the most part, you know it's 120 volts. Maybe some 220 lines are in there because Even this guy, Elaine Musk, who has, a, has defended this thing that's called a Tesla. Maybe a couple people have a those, those things. But by and large, it's 120 volts. But this is, this is pretty much what the systems look like. And those generating plants are all, as we've heard, nuclear, coal, gas, oil, photovoltaics, solar. Three words here that are very important. Mix, mix, mix. Okay. This is what the Midwest, Mid, Midcontinent ISO looks like. Taking a look at this now, we go from Canada to Louisiana, out to Montana, and into Kentucky, thereabouts. As you look at this, you can see Wisconsin's in there, and, and uh, this is something like 170,000, 77,000 megawatts, 1,600 power stations, 66,000 miles of transmission lines. That's a lot of stuff to coordinate. That's what's going on. That's what the MISO does on a continuing basis. And it's establishing markets so that there's day ahead markets in all of this. People bid their generation. Of how they are utilizing systems more efficiently. Say, well, what kind of benefits come out of this? And you take a look at this chart, and you can see that I talked a little bit about improved reliability, and that's 200 and whatever, 175 to $240 million on an annual basis. And more efficient use of existing assets is about 260 to 300 million. But the big kicker here, the one in the center, the chart in the center, 1.8 billion to $2.9 billion of savings because you are not putting in new generation or new transmission lines, but you have found a way to distribute energy in a regional area much more efficiently than a lot of small, little regions trying to furnish their electric loads. That's how you get the savings, and they're substantial. The cost of this thing, about $210 million a year, is part and parcel of, of, of uh, so that's how you get down to 2.1 million, to, to $3 million, the $3 million, up $3 billion a year. I want to be sure I say this at least once tonight. There are opportunities for jobs for white students in this organization. Don't forget that. They are based in Carmel, Indiana. They have offices in Egan, Minnesota. They have offices where we have a control center. We have a control center in in Carmel, Indiana, we have control center, our new control center in Little Rock, Arkansas. Just keep that thought in the back of your head. Taking a look here at the how generation is dispatched, this is what we follow at our control centers. This is load that, no surprises here, base load at, is the dark blue, but notice that it is a, this is an integrated load pattern. And typically, you see peaks and valleys and things like that. But at nighttime, the loader's down, and the daytime, it goes up. And it's the job of the control center in Carmel, Indiana, to be sure that when these demands come in from all over that big region, you saw on that chart not too long ago, 
from all of those regions. These guys at these control centers are sure that there are transmission lines for this to flow on, that there are generating stations from which this power is generated, and that the people will continue, to, and the industry will be continue, continue to have their lights on. Now we get to the subject of this whole thing <coughs> in terms of this conference. We have seen a very, very large increase in renewables in this system. I've been a director for almost eight years. When I arrived on the scene, <coughs> we had about 4,500 megawatts, I think, of wind energy on the MISO system. There were enormous incentives which were being followed by wind developers. We had years of, in the, of people in the queue waiting to get cited. That was really, we were trying to figure out how we we're going to do all that well. This was an industry which was growing rapidly. <coughs> and as it did that, there was an incentive for us as a independent system operator to be sure that there were transmission lines for this energy to flow on. Developers didn't necessarily have to do the transmission lines. They furnished the energy. Regional operators had to figure out how to, how to distribute it. Now, as you take a look at, your, at the charts, the wind was about 70% of the renewables, biomass, and solar in our region, or about 6%, and hydro is about 24%. The renewable, therefore, was about, as you see from the chart, about 19,000 megawatts. That makes the wind, I don't know, 13, 14,000 megawatts. Now, another interesting way to look at the growth of wind in our system, the black line is the renewable portfolio standards in the states in the MISO system. Starts out 2009 essentially zero, works its way up to a lot in 2025. But notice, and this is, all, this is energy that's generated in each year, not installed capacity, but a generator installed in each year. Notice that, at least in our region, we have generated more than the renewable portfolio standards. That's a very good accomplishment, say I. That said, there's a lot of challenge to continue to follow that black line up. Now you say, well, where does all this wind stuff come from? And the interesting part is where it's coming from here is North and South Dakota, and then you're looking at Nebraska and Iowa. Um, some question, you immediately say to yourself, well, what's going on here? I mean, there's no people to speak of, not to diminish anybody, but there's no people in the middle of that area where all that wind is. They're not going to use that energy. How are you going to do it? It comes right back again to this whole concept of having the transmission lines, using existing lines, creating lines where they need to be created, and not so incidentally, finding ways to get people to pay for this stuff. That's always a big deal. And so that's one of the things that we do as a planner. We not only create markets, we also do a lot of system planning in our region. And we bring all our participants, those who are our partners in the MISO, our, and, and we facilitate. And we have some pretty heated discussions as to how this is going to sort, who's going to pay for what. And by and large, it has worked pretty well so far. We do projects that. And on an annual basis, they might be a billion dollars, they might be up to five billion dollars, who knows, but it's a lot of money. This is a chart of the renewable portfolio standards, the requirements. Notice that the blue are the mandates. Wisconsin has a mandate, 10% by 2015. Montana has a mandate, 15%. Notice by 2015. Notice that Minnesota has a very significant mandate. By 2020, it's 20%. I think it's 25% by, by 2025. There are some people that have goals. Indiana has a goal of 10% by 2025. Notice it's getting closer to coal country. And notice in coal country, Kentucky, they don't believe in this stuff. And, 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 and so it's, it's it what I, I said this a little earlier, but there's a, and I've heard it at the conference today, there's a lot of public policy that goes in with this sort of stuff. Not just markets, but there's a lot of public policy. And as one of our speakers said earlier, you can bet on something and you have an election and everything's gone. But that's what you learn to try to deal with. You should deal with these things. 
Now, the wind has significant operational impacts on the MISO. And as you take a look, let's, get, let's help you take a look. Taking a look at that chart, you'll notice how many gigawatt hours come on any given day. That is all over the map. That's up and down, that's up and down. And when I started with all this at uh, 2006, we really had some issues because the wind had blow and then stopped and you said, uh, well, what, better get that coal plant going again or you better get that gas turbine going or have something spinning in spinning reserve ready to follow it. Is that cost effective? Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but you know you're burning coal, you're burning oil, or burning something, not generating power until this thing goes offline, then you're there to back it up. But interestingly to me, and I didn't really think this was possible, but interestingly to me, the forecasting in this area has really become very, very good. I've been surprised at that, in all candor. I was walking in a, a soybean field about four, four years ago at one of our meetings in Minnesota. We all went in a bus and they were showing us big windmills all over the place. Not too unlike what you see when you travel down, whatever it is, uh, coming from Indianapolis to Chicago. And anyway, up in this Minnesota area, there were windmills everywhere. And they were all standing dead still. I said, well, that's great. Yeah. But we had a forecast that they were, they were going to start at 1 o'clock. And at 3 minutes and 1, by God, these things start to turn. I couldn't believe it. But it was just a demonstration that there's some pretty good forecasting capability now. By no means perfect. And it's going to help a lot when people come up with some good reserve, uh, good res uh, I'm sorry, good storage stuff. All right. Take a look at this, and you've seen one of these solar uh, arrays on an earlier chart this evening. The only point of this chart is to show you where all the solar is. Not a big surprise. Uh, largely for those people in that, re in that area, because first of all, there's the interconnect between us and that area is kind of hard to get through. Uh, so in any event, you, the point of the chart is to see the pros and cons. Uh, it's still costly. Prices come down a lot. And it probably will continue to come down, but it's still costly. A lot of photovoltaics on roofs. That's been an interesting, from my perspective, that's, that's been the sort of thing where people can do a pretty good job of, of uh, furnishing their own local needs. You get a lot of hot water, you get a lot of pools, and then uh, heated. And then the question is, how about the electricity side of all this? And that gets to be a little dicier, but it's still a possibility. It's enhanced by the fact that, as we've heard a little earlier, that we have states and federal governments that are interested in, in this subject as a matter of public policy. That's the way, at least for the moment, it's going to work. And people say, well, why should this industry get an get a, uh, advantage? Well, it's not as if the nuclear industry didn't get an advantage, for instance. You think about those kinds of things. And then we heard from some of the other issues about, and the first speaker talked about, well, there's this inherent destruction or damage to the environment that goes on with, let's say, coal that isn't accounted for. So these are the kinds of things that you think about when you talk about the advantages of it. It takes a lot of public policy lobbying in this area. Make no mistake about this, I give my hat is off to those guys, those people that have presented this subject to governments and to the federal government and saying this is a good idea. Now, I suggest to you this stuff is enhanced by finding ways to store it, and especially wind, especially solar. Uh, we, we won't talk a whole lot about it. In, in the 70s, Nelson Rockefeller, governor of New York State, wanted to have a lot of nuclear plants in New York State. One way to enhance that was to have pump storage. Why? Well, because you never really want to shut down a nuclear plant. Once it's on, it really wants to run. And at nighttime, as you saw from one of my earlier charts, there's not as great a demand. So if you were going to use nukes to their fullest advantage, maybe what you want to do is pump the water, have pump storage where you pump the water up at night, and then it runs down during the daytime and furnishes electricity. Great idea. It's not a great idea if you're a guy that lives in the farm and has your land flooded. And people found out that that was, in all candor, uh, a pretty serious roadblock. You ne people never forgot. People never forgot when you flooded their land. And that, that goes on to this day. So 
It's just yet another public policy issue. So you go on to compressed air, you go on to flywheels. Compressed air has been around for a long time. Flywheels have been around for a long time. Maybe that's going to work. But storage batteries have been around for a long time, too. And what I'd suggest to you is just recently, I've been reading and following <coughs> when, our, when I talked about Tesla earlier and Elon Musk, he's putting a plan together, I believe, with a lot of federal money and maybe Nevada money for a battery storage plant in Nevada. And he has a real interest in doing that because his lithium ion batteries are what power the Tesla and their battery pack is about $30,000 right now in each car. They need to bring that price down. And so if those batteries work, he has a terrific way of storing the solar energy idea that he's putting together in Solar City in Buffalo, New York, another billion dollar, more than multi-billion dollar investment. But if these things were to come together, all of a sudden wind and solar have a lot easier way of getting absorbed into the system because it's a lot easier to store this stuff than it is to figure out how you're going to continue to back it up. One cautionary note, one cautionary note. Don't do all of this at once. Don't forget the three magic words, mix, mix, mix. Germany is doing their best to go from a coal-based, nuclear-based economy to all wind. And their goal is to get renewables into 40, 50, 40 to 45 percent of total generation by 2025 and 80 percent by 2050. They've taken out the nukes by 2022 and, of course, reduced consumption by, 20, by 25 percent. Now, the issue there is that there's a very significant cost involved. And it is very important to recognize that when you're doing something like this, you can really raise hob with your economic environment. And so what we know is that the cost of their electricity for industrials has gone up by, it's, it's by a lot, and it's now at a rate of about 150 percent of that in the United States, and their home electricity is something like three times that in the United States. And Dan Jurgen, I guess a lot of you read, uh, has that little quote at the bottom, I won't bother reading, but you can see it. It's just that you, there's classic mistakes. You've got to be sure that you don't just put all your eggs in one basket. And that's a lesson that we keep relearning in this industry, <coughs> probably in life. Now, from the smart grid, we used it for, for purposes of reliability, transmission planning, integration of renewables. That's critically important. I think the most important one on there is communication and information to support decision making. That has helped us a lot. And it's a little different than what you see pegged on radio and TV, especially TV today, where you see people using the smart grid to get information as to when electricity prices are going to be cheaper and when they should turn on their washing machine or not, their dryer. But that's how we get at it. So the question is where we're going from here. And for the most part, it seems to me that this whole focus on renewables is well underway. We've got to keep thinking, that we've got to keep working at it. It's by no means a slam dunk. There's some point at which you can have too much on your system and then your system isn't reliable. The fact of the matter is you want to keep with that reliable, don't forget about that reliable one day in 10 years. That's a very significant consideration in this whole industry. And then maybe the most important bullet point on all these charts tonight is the last one, which talks about good opportunities for graduates from Beloit College. With that, I look forward to your questions and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Gene. Uh, again, I keep uh, inviting speakers to cram an hour and a half worth of material into 20 minutes, and they do an astoundingly good job of it. Uh, I will introduce our uh, fourth speaker, who um, is Lynn Keesling from
electricity regulation in a continually <laughs> evolving environment. Lecturer in the Department of Economics at Northwestern University, Lynn Kiesling. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try to self-monitor, to live up to that high bar that you've set. Um, one of the benefits of going forth out of four speakers is that my three previous speakers have all said things that, um, that I was going to say. So hopefully that will enable me to, uh, to meet my time target. Uh, and, um, and I especially want to thank Warren for inviting me because I'm actually on sabbatical at the moment. And so some of what I'm going to, uh, when I'm at King's College London, so I'm a bit of a further commute up here than just having to drive from Chicago. Uh, and so thank you for, for having me. Um, and so the ideas that I want to talk with you about this evening are questions. And these are research questions that my collaborator and I, this is, is um, joint work with Mark Silberg, who is a class of 2014 Northwestern graduate and um, is going to go on to do much, much uh, more important things than I will have ever done. Uh, we have some questions that we want to explore having to do with the growing market for residential solar. So some of what, uh, what Jean alluded to as the exciting stuff going on on rooftops. Uh, and that has caught our interest. And in particular, um, a, a interesting fact to start with is since the beginning of 2010, the installed residential solar capacity in the US has grown by 232%. And that's a big number. It is a big number growing from a pretty small base, but still it's enough to, to get us thinking, you know, hey, what's going on here? There's some really interesting things going on in residential solar. And so we want to explore that. And there are a few different motivations. There are three motivations in particular that drive what we are embarking on. Um, the first is my longstanding interest in um, digital innovation, you know, and one of the hats I wear is, one of the hats I wear is economic historian, and one of the other hats I wear is technologist, <laughs> right? So, you know, reconciling all of those. Um, and, and for the past decade or so, I've been doing a lot of work uh, on smart grid, and in particular, smart grid interoperability standards, and at kind of an architectural level. And, um, so one of the things that is, is really an interesting motivation for what, what I think is, is going on and what is a, a pivotal time in this industry is the amount of digital innovation that has been going on from outside the industry. Right? A lot of digital innovation that we have seen and that, to quote John, has, you know, how technology has just transformed our lives. Right? And that we are capable of doing and creating and being people and things and activities and relationships that we could never have imagined before digital technology. And um, this has, has come in to the electricity industry slowly, but it is happening. And Jean alluded to some of these. Um, I've got you know, up here a depiction of the standard traditional physical flow and the standard traditional value chain in the electricity industry, which is unidirectional. Right, from generator to consumer in one direction, and that the, the physical grid network has been engineered for that unidirectional flow. And this is an electromechanical network with meters with the spinny dials. Um, what digital technology enables us to create is a more diverse, more heterogeneous, more multi-directional set of value flows and set of physical flows, which requires some re-engineering and thinking about you know, the architecture, the physical architecture of the network, as well as the economic architecture. But if you look at this depiction of, of whoa, sorry, wrong, wrong button. There we go. This depiction of, of a, a kind of a hypothetical smart grid, it's got some of the kind of stuff that John was talking about um, with the you know, solar rooftops, um, backup generators on hospitals, all kind of you know, wind farm over here. There is diversity and it's distributed diversity of both consumption and production in this system. 
And interestingly, you know, in this kind of unidimensional sphere that you know, traditionally we've had, generators are generators, they're producers, they produce. Consumers are consumers, they consume. But once we have residential consumers who have a Tesla in the garage, who have solar PV on the roof, what does that mean? You as a consumer are also potentially a producer. Your, your identity in this, in this system, your potential relationship with others is very different. And that means difference in physical flows and difference in economic flows. Um, but these physical and economic flows obviously are conditioned on the institutional environment. Right? Then by institutions in economics, what do we mean? Institutions are the formal and informal rules and social norms by which we structure our relationships. And so, so in other words, the rules matter. And they're both formal and informal. And so you know, as someone who studies regulation from an institutional perspective, that's what I'm curious about, is as we experience all of this rich technological change, how well does, does our institutional framework enable us to create that robust, resilient, reliable, um, creative technology environment that is, and, and here I will, will be very explicit about owning um, my co-authors co and my kind of normative you know, thing that we're inserting in here, that if we are going to create a low carbon future and a clean tech future, uh, innovation is the number one part of the story. That it, having, having a set of institutional arrangements that are compatible with innovation, that are compatible with individuals harnessing their creativity to go out and figure out new and different ways to maintain our living standards the, and the, the, the ways that we want to get the most out of life while also achieving that balance um, of economic and environmental objectives, innovation is going to be the name of the game. Um, our other motivation is that there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in solar from an innovation perspective. And it's not just going on, and it's hard to see here, but I want to focus your attention on the really dark blue here. So there's really dark blue going on. That really dark blue is the residential solar. And that's where that, you know, since 2010, this 232% increase across the country is coming from. So residential solar is growing. And you can also see utility level solar is growing too, but, but I want to focus on the residential because I think that's the, in, a, a really interesting part of the story. And here's why I think that's an interesting part of the story. A lot of innovators uh, are entering this space. And I think both John and Gene alluded to, you know, Elon Musk is a, one of the founding, you know, investors in Solar City. Uh, and uh, one of my favorite quotes from him is very much the, you know, when I go out and build a business, I build a business to be sustainable, which means I don't chase subsidies. And that's not a direct quote, I'm paraphrasing him. But this idea of having a sustainable business that isn't just policy reactive. And, um, and so there are innovators who are entering this space, and, and th this is during a time when, you know, uh, well, the, the policy space is, is complicated, which I'll come to in a second. But um, what really got me thinking about this is there was a New York Times Magazine interview in 2012 with uh, Danny Kennedy, who's the founder of Sungevity and used to work for Greenpeace. And uh, he's famous for riding around on his orange bike with his orange sunglasses. And, um, but one of the interesting things that, that I thought he pointed out is that as they're trying to grow, and I think if I recall correctly, Sungevity's main differentiator is they will do an entirely kind of online design of the solar for your home. Um, you know, solar City and Sun Edison and Sunrun each have different different value propositions that they're putting out there as solar to the end customer. And they are taking advantage of these, these tax incentives. Um, they're taking advantage of places where there are policies, but that's, um, I guess, the, the icing on the cupcake. Um, but really, the residential retail solar business has been in existence, uh, especially in places like California, since 1978. Um, and there are a lot of, of drivers of this, which I'll come to in a second. 
But there's a lot of technological innovation that has driven down the cost of the um, PV panels, which we've already talked about. But there's also financial innovations. This idea, um, and Sun Edison was one of the pioneers, where basically they put the, the panels on your rooftop and they own the panels and essentially sell you the power and lease your roof from you. And so that way, you as the homeowner don't incur the capital costs or the nuisance or the inconvenience or the siting and having to deal with the city, blah, blah, blah. They deal with all of that. Uh, and so they, you know, what they're bringing to the party is a willingness to take on that financial risk, to, to keep all that stuff on their balance sheet and make it easy for you, the homeowner. Right? And that's, that's great. Um, our third motivation is something that has been talked about a lot the past couple of years in the industry, the infamous utility death spiral. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so what's the utility death spiral? As these distributed resources become more attractive, become more economical, and these innovators come in and lower the transaction costs to homeowners of being able to adopt them, more people will do distributed resources. Uh, and it's not just solar on your roof. It's um, microgrids, say, for office parks or local communities. As more of these distributed resources, um, large-scale demand response in response to the availability of dynamic pricing in wholesale power markets, uh, as more of those opportunities are available, that means less actual use of the physical wires grid. And um, one thing that's important to remember is that the physical, um, as a regulated industry, this industry is regulated based on cost recovery. So this is a cost plus uh, rate of return regulated industry. And so what that means is if people leave your system, everyone else who is still on your system pays more because those costs got to get covered. And so those people who are still customers of the, you know, the regulated utility are going to see their rates go up. And what are they going to say? Demand curves slope downward, we economists like to believe. Uh, so they see their rates go up, and so they're either going to change their behavior and adopt more energy efficiency, or they're going to say, hey, my rates just went up. Why am I sticking with this when I can go do one of those spiffy you know, solar installations on my roof? And so then they invest in distributed energy resources themselves, and you get this death spiral, which, um, and, and the argument is that some manifestations of this have already started in the spring. Um, Barclays uh, issued a fairly controversial um, analyst report where they basically advised their clients to underweight in utilities for this reason. And, uh, so there's a lot of debate going on right now about whether or not this death spiral is actually happening, which would, would basically undermine the existing utility business model. So what is the foundation for this existing utility business model? It's this very simple, very static, very old theoretical model. And those of you who are econ students recognize this as being about natural monopoly, right? So you build one of those massive coal-fired power plants, and that reduces your cost per unit of output that you sell. And so that's where your, your long-run average cost keeps declining, as opposed to having the, small, you know, the smaller generators that are going to have those higher average costs. If you have all of those in one generator, boom, your cost falls. Problem is because there are so many fixed costs, because it's a capital intensive industry, if you have competition, competition competes price down to marginal cost, Mar that price is gonna be below average cost, you're not gonna be able to pay your debt, your, your, your creditors, you're gonna be able to pay for your debt, um, you're gonna exit the industry, um, and in, in the historical narrative I like to tell, in Chicago, that means that Sam Insel buys up your assets at fire sale prices and consolidates into a large monopoly position. And so this, this natural monopoly model is the theoretical foundation on which regulatory theory and regulatory practice are based and upon which our existing regulatory institutions have been built, which is the rate case. You know, the utility goes to the Public Utility Commission, files a rate case, says, here are our assets, 
that we're going to use to deliver reliable power. Um, here's our reasonable rate of return on top of that. So this is the amount of revenue that we're asking to get. We're going to chunk that up into prices to different types of consumers. Boom. Um, and this is the model on which that's built. There are a lot of important critiques of this model. And these are critiques on which I tend to focus because I think they're very persuasive critiques. The first one is um, what I would call our creative destruction critique uh, from from our <coughs> entrepreneurial economist, Joseph Schumpeter, that um, the, the way that we do regulation in theory, its practice is very static, and that regulation means that changes because you know, electricity is, is potentially dangerous, and ha achieving that real-time balance is not easy. But um, but that said, given you know, what Gene suggested, there's a lot of room to, uh, there's a lot of mismatch between the kind of status that, that regulation is based on and the kind of dynamic environment that we actually inhabit and create every single day. Okay, there's a mismatch there. Uh, and so, you know, Schumpeter would argue it is not through driving price down to marginal cost. That's not the right theory of competition. The right theory of competition is that innovators and entrepreneurs compete by offering differentiated products and differentiated value propositions. And um, the, it's through experimentation and through learning and through trial and error that uh, is really the correct theory of competition and that we should build our regulatory institutions on that theory instead. Um, you could also make what I would call a political economy critique based on uh, VHV as a reference to a, a main industrial organization uh, text, uh, Vernon Bis Harrington and Biscusi, where they argue that a serious deficiency of regulation seems to be that it often fails to disappear when the natural monopoly does. You know, and any, you know, one of the reasons why you know, Gene's organization exists is because over the course of the 1980s, smaller scale generation became economical, and so wholesale power markets became competitive. And that is the first disintegration of the natural monopoly. But we still have a lot of places, including Wisconsin, where the full vertically integrated firm is still regulated as a natural monopoly. The regulation has failed to disappear although the natural monopoly has disappeared. Uh, I would also argue at the other end, at the retail, that retail is not, uh, is also competitive, although um, regulatory institutions in states like Wisconsin prevent it from being so. Um, but more importantly, and this is where I think my, uh, my co-author and I focus, is that one of, the thing, one of the biggest criticisms that we would make about regulatory institutions in this industry is the, is the epistemic critique. Right, that they have a flawed epistemology, um, which I, I, will, I will hook that on to the uh, idea in Hayek's 1945 paper, The Use of Knowledge in Society, the knowledge problem, right? the idea that market processes aggregate diffuse private knowledge, and that what really happens when we have competitive processes, market processes, is that people discover what their preferences are in the process of engaging in exchange. And when regulation claims to stand in for that market process, it's actually missing a lot of that diffuse private and often tacit, right? It's knowledge we don't even know we are exercising. Um, and that regulation cannot replicate that information. And it's very important to remember that prices are signals wrapped in incentives and that when, um, when we don't have institutional frameworks that enable the communication of that knowledge through prices, we are less likely to actually make good resource allocation and investment and innovation decisions. So that's basically the epistemic critique. Um, also, and, and again, my speak, uh, previous speakers all alluded to this, um, regulation in this industry is a heck of a lot more complicated than it was back in 1907 when the state of Wisconsin founded the first Public Utility Commission, <coughs> and which was grounded in this static, this static allocative efficiency idea of economic efficiency, which doesn't talk about the fact that the, uh, the external costs created by burning fossil fuels aren't included in that concept of efficiency, 
And so now when we think about the, the broader context of environmental quality is embedded in that, the policy framework and the policy objectives are more complicated. So in essence, we have a very complex, this is a very complex space, right? The economy is a complex adaptive system, but the theoretical framework on which our regulatory institutions are built and on which our regulatory practice happens are static and not taking into account the dimensions of the complexity uh, of, of, our, of our system. So, my, so the question that we're trying to grapple with and that, that I invite you to help us grapple with is what are the regulatory institutions that are compatible with this complexity and with these evolving policy objectives of economic and environmental <coughs> quality? And, um, and clearly we're, we're focusing here on the idea of you know, clean technology and innovation in the electricity space. And our hypothesis and, and the, the, the theoretical framework we're working from is, is going to, we're gonna explore the different kind of um, policies at the state level, so different state level policies, and ask to what extent do they enable experimentation? And so from our perspective, the better theory of competition for thinking about um, you know, forward looking innovation in energy in a complex system is one that enables trial and error and learning and experimentation on the part of producers. Obviously, when you think about entrepreneurs and innovators, this is part of what you were talking about. But consumers also experiment, right? You go into the Apple store and you play around with all the different cool things, right? And you figure out, oh, well, maybe I'll get this one. And then you get it and you kind of keep it for a while and then you, maybe you love it, maybe it's okay. and then you go and you go to the other store and try the, you know, the Google Nexus tablet instead, right? One of the things that we are increasingly doing as consumers in the digital age is we are trial and error experimenters. We are learning through trial and error. And um, we can do that in the energy space as well. And, um, and we haven't done so for the past century when electricity has been sold as a commodity rather than as a service. <coughs> and so I'm gonna make three arguments for experimentation and then I will, I will go to my punchline. Um, and and I, I wanna make sure to say this for a particular reason. Um, why are we focusing on experimentation? The first is the arguments of this guy Schumpeter, right? Creative destruction, right? The disruptive entrepreneur. And if there's anything that we have seen in the digital innovations of the past two decades, it is the fact that, that the way we see competition leading to economic growth and to improvements in, in how we can live our lives, uh, although sometimes it may not feel like an improvement when you're like, oh wait, I just meant to check Facebook for five minutes and it's been two hours. Um, <laughs> but it is improvement, right? Uh, is things like product differentiation, bundling, changing market boundaries, right? That kind of experimentation and really pushing away and changing boundaries is how competition actually happens. Um, one of the things that regulation does is it creates, it stipulates market boundaries and stipulates what products are and are not considered in the market. Um, and that's very antithetical to the Schumpeterian disruptive entrepreneur. Um, I mean, if you think about the, t the convergence we've seen in technology, you know, what, what we now call a phone, um, well, we, it's not at all what, like what we used to call a phone, and what we now call a phone is actually a lot like what we used to call a cray, <coughs> uh, cray you know, ginormous computer. <laughs> so, you know, this breaking down of market boundaries and market definitions is an important thing and gets overlooked a lot. Um, but at the same time, there's a, um, Experimentation allows for entrepreneurs to come in and get ahead of the market, right? So what John was talking about, getting ahead of the market, has a lot to do with the um, Austrian economist Israel Kirzner and what he calls the equilibrating entrepreneur, who can kind of get ahead, not necessarily disrupt, but see where the market's going and get there first and provide you with a new way of thinking about things that you had not conceived of before and profit by it. And then finally, obviously, the epistemic context is where we're going to focus, 
is that the experimentation is important because that's how we generate our, our, our knowledge about what products and services are out there that we might want. And, and that's really important for coordination across individuals and across the economic and environmental objectives that are now joined together so deeply in this industry. The reason I wanted to make sure to show this slide was uh, Warren has seen this slide before because I was fortunate enough to be invited to be a speaker in Upton Forum three years ago and that was where I really started to formulate this experimentation theoretical framework. And so I'm, you know, the, the Upton Forum is, is beneficial not just to the Beloit community and to the, the Upton Scholar but to speakers as well because I got a lot of new ideas from being here that I've been able to carry forward into my research. So I want to uh, thank you for that. Um, and so what we're going to do is basically work on this experimentation idea and start comparing across states um, to look at, at things like, you know, this is, is for example, California's um, small scale, less than, than uh, 10 kilowatt solar installations. And, you know, what's driving that? And Arizona's in there, New Jersey's in there. Um, there's a lot of <coughs> interesting and important stuff going on there, but um, the punchline that I would say is our, the conclusion that we are drawing at this point, um, and again I'm going to invoke Hayek in this, is that when we think about regulatory institutions and the role that regulation can play in enabling the innovation that can lead to a cleaner tech future, that the important role of the regulator should be as a gardener and not an engineer. because um, our ability to actually achieve what we imagine we can design is less than we think it is. And so instead that we think um, focusing on cultivating an environment that is rich for others to follow their creativity in enabling new value propositions to come to market, that that's going to be most likely to lead us to a clean tech future. In such a short amount of time, it's going to be as if all of our brains are just uh, um, full to bursting. Or uh, the, another metaphor is, wow, we've had such a great meal. Now we're going to really top it off by inviting uh, our 2014 Upton Scholar, uh, Robert N. Stevens, to come up and synthesize and react <laughs> and really so totally overwhelm us with all this. Uh, and and uh, there are few people better equipped to do that than our 2014 Upton Scholar, who is indeed one of the world's leading thinkers on climate change policy. And were I to read all of the things that uh, Professor Stevens does, I would uh, take way too much time. But let me say that he is both uh, an educator, a theorist, and a practitioner who's deeply involved in the work of the IPCC that just released its fifth assessment report. And he's also involved in the uh, climate negotiations with the United Nations. So. Uh, We'll give the last word before questions to Professor Stevens. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Ward, very much. Uh, the hour is late, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cram two minutes of substance into ten minutes. Uh, took you a while to pick up on that, huh? Okay. So um, we've heard four interesting uh, presentations. I've taken notes uh, from four distinguished and knowledgeable uh, panelists. Uh, those of you who are here on Tuesday evening when we had a similar session in which I was the commenter at, at the end, the focus was really on energy demand and how that relates to uh, climate change issues. And tonight, largely the focus has been on energy supply, although not exclusively. Uh, 
So in the 10 minutes I have, I couldn't really do justice, obviously, to the diverse set of views and expertise that we've heard. So rather, as a professor of environmental economics who teaches in a policy school, what I'm going to do is to provide a framework for thinking about what the title of the session is, which is Renewable Energy Climate Change, and I'm going to relate it in the context of public policy. Um, activities that are carried out absent effective public policies in this realm will be grossly insufficient, and that's one of the themes that I'm going to offer to you. And that's for obvious reasons. One, the problem is an externality issue. It's an unintended consequence of market activity. It's not in the interest of individuals or firms to take it into account. And the other is that compounding that is that it's a global commons problem, and so it's not in the interest of any individual country to put in place regulatory apparatus. It can free ride on others, so we need some forms of international cooperation. These are all things I'll be talking about at length tomorrow night. Um, but I'll just state them now as a premise. But when I say policies need it, that doesn't mean any policy. It doesn't mean crazy regulatory policy that stops innovation. It obviously refers to good public policy. Now, given the negative climate and, for that matter, other impacts of fossil fuel uh, generation of electricity, uh, arguments can certainly be made for greater reliance on less carbon intensive sources of energy. There's no doubt about that. But of course, that's not the same thing as saying greater reliance on renewable sources of energy because less carbon intensive sources of energy include in the short term, very importantly, the greater use of natural gas shifting electricity generation, such as in the United States, from coal to natural gas, something that's been taking place in this country since before the year 1990 and, of course, has accelerated tremendously in the last few years because of the opening up of unconventional shale gas resources through new technology. But it should also include important zero carbon sources of energy like nuclear power. And then finally, consideration in this regard has to be given to another source of what you could think of as zero uh, emissions generation, which is simply reducing demand. That is greater efficiency in the generation and use of electricity, the topic from Tuesday night. So all of those have to be included in the potential mix. The weighting has to be determined in terms of what's most effective and what's cheapest, presumably. But for a variety of reasons, much of the focus of U.S. policy discussions uh, has often been on wind power and solar power, two specific renewable sources of power, which are favorites of green NGOs and a lot of other people uh, in society. So what I'm going to do now is turn to the realm of public policy, and in doing so, I'm going to start by asking what sorts of public policies will be best to reduce carbon emissions? We ought not ask a different question, in my view, which would be the much more narrow question of what policies are best to bring about greater use of wind and solar power specifically. And the reason is that's simply the wrong question. By asking the question that way, you've eliminated some potential answers. You know, and something we teach at the Harvard Kennedy School is a great way to manipulate your boss in government is to find the question in a way such that he's forced to take the answer you want. It's unethical in government and it's terrible in policy analysis to do that. So that's the wrong question. We have to ask this broader question so that we don't eliminate potentially important responses. So first of all, what about subsidies for energy sources that we like? This could presumably include subsidies such as we've heard of tonight in the form of tax, credit, tax credits or tax cuts for wind and solar, or it could be tax credits or subsidies of other kinds for nuclear power. And by the way, a tax credit is another special kind of a subsidy, but it still has, has been stated a subsidy from the government to the private sector. 
And as you probably know, the production tax credit that recently expired, now there's a big push to try to get it back into place. Indeed, during this lame duck period, we'll have to see what transpires. Now, from an economic perspective, from an economic perspective, the, these subsidies are not the best approach. Indeed, they are a rather problematic approach. Why do I say that? For several reasons. First of all, they inherently pick and choose the solutions because you have to target the subsidy. There are technologies that no one in this room can imagine, that certainly at least I cannot imagine, and they're not going to receive any subsidies because we can't even name them. So that's a problem. Additionally, subsidies have the effect in this realm, in the electricity realm, of artificially lowering the price of electricity. We're reducing the price. Depending upon the nature of the regulation and where it is in the United States, it's going to get passed on to consumers. Increase, that's going to encourage greater demand. It's counterproductive in terms of the overall thrust to reduce CO2 emissions. And then finally, they're very costly to government. They are extremely costly to government. And at a time at which governments cannot afford such largesse, they're better not thought of to be increased. Indeed, they should be thought of to be eliminated. So what does an economic perspective recommend instead? If that's what it recommends against subsidies, what does it recommend instead? Well, it recommends in favor of the inverse. And by using the inverse of a subsidy, we can get all the good news and not the bad news. Quite simply, to get what we want, that is lower carbon emissions, while avoiding that list of problems I just went through, it is necessary to increase the cost of the energy coming from the carbon intensive sources. That means from coal, petroleum, and natural gas, but mainly from coal, at least in the short term. This can be done by an upstream tax, a so-called carbon tax, an upstream tax on the carbon content of the three fossil fuels proportional to their carbon content. At the tax will be put in place at the mine mouth, the wellhead, and the point of import. Or it could be done with what is functionally equivalent, functionally equivalent, and that is an upstream cap and trade system. The differences between these two instruments are trivial compared to the difference between them and all of the alternatives. <clears throat> so it's only through one of these two approaches, which I'll just generalize as I'll call them carbon pricing, it's only through such carbon pricing that a policy can be put in place that's going to achieve truly meaningful emissions reductions in the United States, which I'll define in a political way, really, and that is the official U.S. position in international discussions and the official position of the current administration, an 83 percent reduction by 2050 of emissions compared with 2005. Only a carbon pricing policy can possibly achieve that. Now, why do I say that only a carbon pricing approach can do it? Uh, the first reason is simply one of feasibility. Given the hundreds of millions of diffuse and diverse sources of energy generation and, more importantly, consumption in a modern economy, it's impossible otherwise to do it through a conventional regulatory approach. You know, markets are, after all, simply a device for transmitting information. That's what a market does. It solves an information problem. It, so it sends information about relative scarcity, in this case, the scarcity of the atmosphere. So all decision makers on a daily basis, hundreds of millions of people making literally billions of economic decisions, all of us in this room and everyone else, whether we're in industry, commercial, industrial, or as consumers, each time we're making those decisions, we're pushed in the direction of being essentially more carbon friendly, and then that goes up the line for technology diffusion and the like. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that that approach is cost effective whereas other approaches will not be. And I won't take time to try to offer the proof or explanation for that, but that's a, 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 a fact of the nature of our economy, is that these approaches can do the job at minimum cost, whereas other approaches tend to be very costly, sometimes by an order of magnitude in our experience in the United States with other environmental problems. And then third and finally, and perhaps most important really in the long term, is that only a carbon pricing regime can provide the ad adequate long-term price signals that are going to be necessary to bring about the massive amount of technology invention and innovation 
that will be required to address the problem. The deployment of existing technologies is not sufficient. It's not close to being sufficient. We're going to need the invention and the innovation or commercialization of a whole set of technologies. I don't know what they are. No one in this room knows what they are. But the incentives from the price mechanism is, mechanism is what will drive that. So in my view, anything in this country, and I'm referring just to the United States in these comments, anything in this country, anything else other than a carbon pricing regime, is ultimately going to be either relatively minor in its impacts, or worse yet, just symbolic, and make some people feel better but not do much about the problem, or worse yet than that, can even be counterproductive. So it's for all of those reasons that my perspective, at least, on the discussion tonight is that in the long term, our focus, the framework, has to be on getting the prices right, and that means sensible pricing of carbon. And that's the end of tonight's sermon. <laughs> still have the energy to entertain questions, then we can um, uh, ask them to come forward, we have seats for them, uh, and we can entertain a few questions. a microphone back, which is just picking up the uh, uh, signal for the uh, streaming of this. And then uh, when you have a question, I'll bring the microphone uh, to you as well. So um, the hardcore are here, <laughs> ready to ask questions. Very nice presentations and uh, compliments on sequencing them so that each one generated questions and the next one answered. Um, but uh, I had, I guess, several questions that were uh, discussed and addressed, and I guess it boils down to one, and this is maybe for Dr. Staven. What's the right price of a barrel of oil? So it, it depends on what you mean by the right price. If what you mean is the price that would be best socially, then the right, is that what you mean? One that incorporates all the externalities yeah. of its use so that uh, the market will work properly. Right, so um, given that, then there are two factors that we'd want to take into a price. So we'd say, what's the market price that the market is determining? What part of that market price is due to the fact that we have cartels and imperfect competition? We'd want to adjust for that, for social optimality. And then we want to adjust for those, uh, the externalities, which some of them are climate change, but in the case of petroleum, a lot of them are not climate change. There are other very, very serious ones. It's a much different situation because we're talking largely about liquid fuels for motor vehicles in which case there are congestion externalities, there are externalities associated with the fact of the imperfections of the insurance market, there, and then of course there are all the externalities that are associated with conventional air pollutants from motor vehicles. And if you put all that together, you know, what is the optimal tax, on, for instance, on a gal gallon of gasoline? I mean, I don't know. You know, the general thinking from economics is that the, the British tax is too high. Uh, compared to the socially optimal amount, this is just from the economic literature, and that the U.S. tax is drastically too low, so that instead something on the order, maybe it's two dollars a gallon, uh, might be more appropriate. But this is something that would be increasing over time. For Professor Stephen, 
Uh, why is the United States using the, uh, for carbon pricing, the uh, 2005 date, and is Europe using the 1990 date? So that's a, um, an interesting question. Um, because I'm going to try to do this briefly. Uh, so it turns out that the, so what the question was, in case you didn't hear it, why is it that Europe, whenever it makes its announcements or statements or commitments in the international negotiations for reductions of emissions, it always does it relative to the year 1990, and the United States has insisted on doing it relative to the year 2005. So that's the question. And uh, the, the reason for 1990, where that year came from in the first place, is that was what was agreed to in the Kyoto Protocol, is that would be the base year. But let's think now about how that year is for Europe and how it is for the United States, that base year. So several things happened after 1990. One of the things that happened was a, parallel, a period of unparalleled economic growth in the United States. Some people would call them the Clinton years. But that's the, that period of time from 1990 to about 1998, we have 35% increase in gross domestic product, therefore an increase in energy, not quite as much because our economy is becoming more energy efficient over time, and therefore an increase in CO2 emissions, although again, not as much because we've been decarbonizing but a very large increase. In Europe did not that have that economic growth. Japan was in recession. Canada did not even follow the United States. The US was really alone in that time. So right away, that 1990 baseline is very difficult for the US compared to Europe, but that's not the end of the story. What else happened post-1990? Well, the fall of the wall, the collapse of the former Soviet Union, and therefore German reunification. When German reunification took place, it meant that all that old Rust Belt industry and electricity generation power stations in the former East Germany were closed down. As you may recall, there was massive unemployment and there was migration to formerly West Germany. But that's all in the baseline, all that filthy uh, CO2 emitting uh, technology. And the result is for Germany that when you look at the numbers that it actually have what people refer to as hot air, that is as business as usual emissions would actually be less than what its target was. It hasn't quite worked out that way. But anyway, it's very modest. Likewise, in the United Kingdom, so the two most important economies in, in, in Europe. Uh, in the United Kingdom, for reasons having nothing to do with climate change, much earlier, a conservative government under Margaret Thatcher privatized British coal. What happened when British coal was privatized? Well, change in price, fall in price, and then, uh, pardon me, rise in price, and the result was a shift to natural gas, combined with opening up of North Sea gas. So, England was able to re reduce emissions over that period of time. And so in fact, if you look at the EU as a whole, then they were in a very fortunate position because of that baseline. Now, it's not true of all the countries. Countries of Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, it's very, very difficult for. But for the largest economies in Europe and the Scandinavian countries, because of policy actions, it was a much easier target. So for the United States to use 1990 was always very difficult. So the US began to use unilaterally you know, a statement of 2005 for domestic laws and regulations, and now is pushing for a uh, agreement that'll be reached eventually in Paris in 2015, in which individual countries will essentially set their own baselines, and then the uh, centralized framework convention will calibrate these to each other. Thanks. Uh, Professor Stevens gave a, a, a stirring sermon about the importance of carbon pricing. So I'm just curious from all of the panelists uh, quickly to share your perspectives on carbon pricing and the importance, relative importance of carbon pricing to the MISO, to your business model, to the regulatory work that you're studying, and to this proposal that you came out with for Beloit College. Uh, great. Uh, no, I, I would agree with Professor Stevens that a much more efficient approach to handling the situation would be to price into electricity, for my example. Um, carbon pricing, but then also, as noted on that first slide, the other costs of electricity, um, other externalities. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, especially for coal-fired power, there's other contaminants of concerns, mercury, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, and others. Uh, and also other concerns also for natural gas, and frankly also for biogas, because biogas is basically a, a, a lesser form of natural gas in my mind. Um, so if that occurred, as is indicated in my slide, my slide is not necessarily perfect in terms of the pricing, as uh, Dr. Stevens noted, there's, there's different ways of looking at it, different people have different prices, but if the price of electricity for Beloit College was 14 cents versus 6.8 cents, I think actually you'd get to a very similar result in terms of how the project would work. 
but instead of the project working because of tax incentives, it would work because of the proper price of, um, of energy. And, um, and I agree that it would be much better to not single out certain technologies like solar and others to get that, that benefit. But frankly, in my world, which is the world working with private clients and public clients who have to work with existing systems, you have to work with what's available. What's available and what's most attractive, I think, for a, a situation like this one where you might put solar on a campus is to think through how to take advantage of the existing incentives. Yeah, um, yeah in uh, the, the, comp the policy environment around the, the renewables in particular is so complex, right, at the state level. And I think Gene showed the, the little table with all the check marks of the carve outs and the this and the that and the tax, it, it's just, um, I'm coming to refer to it constantly as a Rube Goldberg machine. And everyone I talked to was like, yeah, it's totally a Rube Goldberg machine. And that if we could do, you know, extreme makeover regulatory edition and just, you know, wipe that stuff away and do uh, a carbon tax and technology agnostic, low entry barrier uh, regulatory approaches with retail competition, that would be my preferred kind of second best. You know, I, I'm. Uh, the, the reason I'm up here hesitating is um, I, I, there are a couple of things that, that I would probably disagree with Professor Stavens on or at least push back on a little bit. One is, and I think the three of us in particular use the same model and the same graphs when we teach our students that the um, emissions permit market and the tax if you can design them correctly, they are theoretically equivalent and they get you to the same place. Um, but m I think once you add in the political economy reality and start to think about the public choice analysis and the rent seeking and the lobbying and the money that's on the table in per permit market design versus tax design, then the question gets a lot more complicated. And so I would, I, I think the equivalence breaks down once you think about the political economy. Um, and I'm also not inclined to think of the problem as being one of getting the prices right because we don't know what the right price is. You know, so what's the right price of a barrel of oil? No idea. And, I, yeah, it's, and, and that's what I mean by the epistemology, right? The, the epistemology that gets ignored and assumed away in a lot of economics is, you know, thinking that these things are knowable when they really aren't. And so I tend to think of it more as what's the regulatory framework that can enable people to coordinate and achieve environmental and economic policy objectives and the price mechanism is what will enable that coordination although we don't know what P-STAR is. But we know that the process of trying to find P-STAR is the best, uh, best feasible process for answering that question. I think your question was, how would our business change if we had a price on carbon? There are two words there, price and carbon. Uh, and uh, so first it would distill this down to something simple, which is carbon, as opposed to trying to pick technology winners or solutions. That would help. Uh, price would change the level point for my financial natural capital balance point in the renewable energy space, uh, but more broadly, in a more uh, secular uh, perspective for our business, we don't have a lot of runway ahead of us in the renewable sector right now because of how complicated it is, how difficult it is, and how uh, unreliable the incentives are, how hostage they can be held to political circumstance. So our runway in front of us is in water, it's in habitat, uh, it's in other similar kinds of uh, problems for which infrastructure built over the long term correctly uh, can provide uh, environmental benefit, environmental stewardship, and uh, financial return. So for us, it would disruptively open the opportunity to address the carbon issue more holistically. Uh, it, it, it would uh, change, it would thicken all those value propositions for us, which are all very thin now for as far as the eye can see, at best. 
we sort of do this kind of analysis even now in terms of your question. As you're well aware, the Environmental Protection Agency is requiring a very large number of coal plants to be considered by utilities. After all, we are a segment of utilities in our organization voluntarily. And when their decision was, when the EPA decision was put in place, we already have gone to an extraordinary amount of planning as to what are we going to do when all these plants go away. And, and so that is in sense a reduction of carbon in a way that's different than the carbon tax. But my answer is by way of saying we are in a position when a policymaker makes a decision, we then have to find the best way to deal with it. And that's pretty much how we would deal with perhaps the tenets of your question. But I can tell you on the basis of what's going on right now with the elimination of old, heavily polluting coal plants, we are looking to how we're going to make our system work with less energy available or less generation available and maybe better use of wind from some place or another or maybe some new, new power plants of uh, maybe combined cycle or something like that with natural gas. But that's, that's how we would react to it. Because we're doing it right now. That's, that, that doesn't, that's not an unusual happenstance. Somebody will have an idea, somebody will have a policy that will impact our members, and then we will be in a position where we have to deal with it. But providing reliability at all times. It's very late, and so I would like to take one more question. And that question should be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Like your question, brilliant. So who has a <laughs> the last brilliant question? <laughs> hey, no pressure. Thank you. I'm not sure if this question is quite brilliant, but it's something that I would hope to have answered. In our class, we've talked a lot about this polycentric approach to attacking the climate change problem. So looking at a very wide range of levels that we need to attack it from. And I think the small to mid-sized projects that your investment firm is looking at are a really key part of that in really incorporating this localized awareness of the climate change problem. And so I was wondering if you could perhaps speak to the perception of and appetite for these investments, both domestically and internationally. And if perchance, um, I know that We've seen a lot of money go into the emerging markets lately. So is this an opportunity for us to look at these investments to possibly be a stepping stone towards facilitating a development path that really differs from our own? I think that's a question for me. So not only is your question brilliant, but it ends on a hopeful note. Uh, the, we talk to uh, people of enormous wealth. And uh, the the interest level in this is unparalleled. Uh, we sit across the table from people in all different uh, stations in society, um, all of whom understand the dilemma that we face and are frustrated by our inability to solve it with the sort of elegance that Professor Stevens has suggested, but they want to do something. And they want to deploy their capital in a way that matters. So we have plenty of opportunity, uh, which, gives me, which gives me great hope. Um, and I'm grateful that you picked up on the small to midsize, because remember, Microsoft wasn't always this big. Apple wasn't always this big. Uh, when we try to solve these big, in my opinion, when we try to solve big systemic problems at the system level, incumbents generally can't do that. You have to find someone else, innovators, experimenters, working with incumbents to strike the balance. So I will conclude by, uh, by telling you, be hopeful. The people that we're talking to uh, see this. Before you burst into applause at that point, <laughs> you certainly deserve applause at that point, I would like to thank two groups. I would like to thank our five panelists, for doing two hours and 29 minutes of brilliance. And when you clap, I also want to thank 
the audience for two hours and 20 minutes of real attention. So thank you all. Oh,